The first thing I noticed here is that um, I misspelled Rahm Emanuel. So uh, I apologize for that for all the Americans in the audience. Um, how many people actually know who Rahm Emanuel is here? Okay, for those of you who don't know, uh, he's uh, Barack Obama's former White House Chief of Staff who was uh, infamously uh, kind of crucified for using the term fucking retarded uh, in public. Uh, and considering uh, this statement, uh, the last presentation that I gave in public, I got threatened with a lawsuit uh, for defamation by using the term fucking retarded in my presentation. So uh, if anyone's going to be offended by uh, me cussing like a sailor up here or uh, some of the things that you may see on these slides may project images that could be considered offensive, uh, you may want to go to another talk. I will give you permission to leave now, and I will not harass you. Okay, so we're good. Um, <laughs> when I first submitted a proposal for this talk, I mean, this is like six or seven months ago, um, I wanted it to be kind of like a rant on open source in the Ruby community. Um, you know, things change over time, and uh, I think I've rewritten this talk three times now. Uh, so what I want to discuss today is pretty much open source in the Ruby world and from two sides of the story. As a author or maintainer of an open source project, uh, what you should and what you should not be doing to make our lives in the Ruby community easier. And also from a contributor and a user standpoint, uh, things that you should be doing uh, with respect to open source to uh, make the world a better place. So let's, let's start off with a little bit of a uh, statistic there. That's 160 million. Um, I believe Ruby Gems is like 162 million now, but it's over 160 million downloads of gems from rubygems.org. Um, that's 22,000 versions of gems cut and over 1,500 total gems. Um, that's a fuck ton. Uh, the Ruby open source community is, is ridiculous in the amount of projects that they push out and um, it's exponentially growing. And uh, because of this growth is, uh, I wanna try and like, get everyone on a common ground here and uh, hopefully set some standards. I'm gonna throw some opinions out there. I'm a highly opinionated person and uh, we can agree or we can disagree and at least uh, we're gonna have a fun time with this. Um, let's first start as a maintainer of an open source project. Um, I've got expectations uh, when I want to contribute to your open source project and as an author of an open source project of certain basic things that need to be happening uh, in order to make people's lives easier to you know, contribute to the project. So there's some things that I consider understood, um, which not all projects do, but um, all projects should do. Um, first of all, you should be using Git. And this is like a thank you, Captain Obvious moment. Uh, if you're not using Git, uh, I know Mercurial is kind of a play toy, but uh, you should be using Git, and you should be posting your project on GitHub. Uh, I know there's Bitbucket, there is uh, Unfuddle, there's various other sites, but GitHub has pretty much taken over the community. Uh, the social coding aspect of GitHub um, has made, you know, contributions to open source uh, just incredible lately. They've revolutionized the, the industry and uh, everyone I think needs to embrace it and I know this is kind of like sucking on the mother teeth of GitHub right now, but uh, just do it. Um, RVM, uh, I've gotten a lot of complaints uh, over the last year about RVM. Uh, it's not that hard to use. You should be using RVM in your project. You should be committing your RVM RC. 
Um, some people will tell you not to do this. I'm telling you to do this. Uh, the last thing that I ever want when forking and cloning your repo is to switch into the directory and having my global gem set polluted with uh, dependencies for a specific gem. So definitely use RVMRC, uh, use RVM and commit your RVMRC. Um, you should be using Bundler uh, at this point. Um, it's pretty much bug free now. Um, there's a few issues here and there, but what I want to do when I want to contribute to your project is I want to clone the repo, I want to change into that directory, I want to do gem install, bundler, I want to do a bundle install, and then I want to run rake. And I want it to all work fine. And there's really uh, no excuse for that not to work. Um, if there's specific dependencies of your open source library to databases or other frameworks uh, that should be documented uh, in an obvious fashion uh, in order to ease people's setup of your project. Uh, continuous integration for open source. Um, don't do it. Uh, simply put, uh, given this statement, uh, there, there's no real point when, you, when it comes to CI uh, for your open source project to ever have to do it. Uh, you have a small amount of contributors to your repository, people who have commit access. Uh, they should be trusted. They should know exactly what their Git workflow should be. Uh, they know, uh, you know, you run your tests, everything passes, you're gonna do a Git commit. Um, everything's kosher. You're gonna do a Git pull rebase for any other change that someone else may have, uh, may have committed and then you're gonna run your tests again, and they're all gonna pass, and you're gonna push. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple, there's really no need for CI whatsoever. Um, and I don't know why open source projects do it, and I kind of want that to stop. Um, when I call document, documentation imperialism, uh, documentation is a thing that seems to be lacking in the open source community right now. I think there's um, a very small number of open source frameworks in the uh, Ruby community that really do a good job of documentation. Uh, Rails is one of them, Data Mapper is one of them, um, Plug, Mongo is one of them. Uh, what I'd like to say is for documentation imperialism is you, you should shoot for as many lines of documentation that America has troops overseas. That's a lot. Um, but documentation can come in several different forms. Um, the first thing that you can do as an author for documentation is a well-written readme. Um, and especially if you're using GitHub, um, that readme is showing up on your project homepage. And this is the best first point of entry to your project on letting people know how to use it. Um, you can use a GitHub wiki uh, for your documentation, let people contribute to it. Um, that's uh, a really easy way as well. Um, examples. Uh, a lot of people like to go the route of examples in their projects. Um, uh, as long as you make it quite obvious that uh, your documentation is in an examples directory, code speaks very loud, uh, that's another form of documentation. Um, API doc. Um, this is a small pet peeve of mine uh, for people who write libraries who don't provide API documentation. Uh, it's not that difficult. Um, you know, you're probably in the mode of test, implement your methods there, everything's good. Write the documentation to that method right at that point. Um, it is lazy for someone not to provide API documentation on any public method in an open source project. Uh, and people rely on these things uh, to understand what's going on in your framework. Uh, Well-written test suite. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important testing is in frameworks, and I'm gonna cover testing in detail here, but um, testing is also documentation. 
uh, and a well-written test suite is essential uh, to allowing users of your framework to know what's going on, how to use it. Uh, for larger frameworks, uh, probably a website uh, for documentation is needed. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, Rails and Data Mapper before. Uh, they have very good websites uh, telling you exactly how to use the framework. Um, code examples are really good. And uh, any extra resource that you can provide to your users uh, in order to, for them to use your framework easier is uh, always a good thing. Uh, and the last thing on the documentation front, which I think is probably the, the most important thing uh, that you can do as far as documentation goes, is a mailing list. And why I think mailing lists are important is that mailing lists provide context. Um, if I'm uh, searching for a specific issue on whatever framework I'm using, whatever library I'm using, and I go to Google and I search for a specific issue and I can get a mailing list thread, then not only do I have documentation on how to solve my problem, I've got context around this. And I've got context around the decisions that were made around the implementation of that feature. I've got decisions that were made um, around why maybe uh, something was not implemented. And the conversations that happen on mailing lists are far more important than any static doc, uh, documentation can give you. So um, if you are writing an open source project, uh, I recommend highly that uh, you have a mailing list. More on the testing front. Uh, We've gotten into a big thing lately over the past year, two years, of the concept of outside-in testing. And this happens at the application level, and uh, usually with Cucumber. And for application code, um, this is a great tool. Um, we've got uh, whatever the language you speak, human uh, readable tests uh, that the business can understand, um, that are easy for potentially testers to write, uh, but at the same time, uh, for library code, this is uh, kind of a waste of our time. Uh, and I know there are a lot of big Cucumber fans out there, but I want to tell everyone, please do not use Cucumber for testing library code. Um, as a developer, I am your user of library code. Uh, I don't want to look through Cucumber scenarios and then have to go to your step definitions in order to find out the exact code that I need to write in order to use your library. It's an extra step for me that is unnecessary. It's a layer of abstraction in a test suite that should never, ever have to happen for a user who is a developer. Um, and if you are one of those crazy psycho developers who loves to go nuts with your regex, um, my grep becomes useless when trying to find uh, what your feature is actually testing. Um, I'm going to say there's one exception to this rule, and that is RSpec. And uh, how many people here have looked at the RSpec features? So we can maybe say that David Chalensky is walking the fine line between genius and insanity with those things. but. If you look at the RSpec features, and I'm not showing any code up here um, for the main reason because usually my talks are code heavy and image heavy and have audio and I'm going bare bones today. But uh, if you go to the RSpec uh, features, uh, he's actually testing that a file gets generated with specific code in it in order for you to see the API. And if you uh, look at relishapp.com, where all the RSpec documentation is, he's using the features as the documentation. And to me, that's acceptable, but it's, um, it's really excessive on uh, the testing front uh, from a maintainer's point of view uh, in order to do that. So anyways. On the topic of outside-in testing continuing, um, We've all drank Jaeger at some point. And uh, I want to 
introduce a testing technique that I've used uh, for over a year now on library code, which I call the Jägermeister technique. And we all, we all know that Jäger comes in, and then Jäger eventually comes out. So we're going to call this an inside-out testing technique. Um, so the, what goes in, and it works, uh, and then eventually the, the crap exits uh, because your body rejects it. And this is what I want to talk about uh, as far as inside, uh, outside into inside out testing is that when you're doing outside in testing and we're going to say you should be using our spec here and nothing else um, I don't think there's any compelling reason to use any other test for uh, framework for library code other than our spec um, you've written your functional tests in our spec and you've executed everything from a user standpoint uh, your entry points to your API but what outside-in testing doesn't give you is um, control over the implementation of your code. So you can have working code, and it can be a shit design. Um, you can go crazy uh, going outside-in. And what I like to do is you do outside-in to make sure your framework works uh, from a user-facing standpoint. And then you come back and you unit test using mocks inside-out. Uh, and for any of you who are mock heavy testing people, you know that if you've got a poor class design, poor OO design, and you're mocking, it is excruciating to mock. Uh, so the idea behind this is that you would write your functional tests first, get everything to work, and come back around and use your unit tests uh, to flush out the actual OO design of your classes. Um, Another good side aside to this is that once you've got all your mocks in place and everything is tested and passing, for someone to come into your framework and contribute some code that could be, you know, shady, dodgy, um, it's going to be a nightmare for them to implement. So you've got control over your design at a level beyond anything else by mocking um, and doing functional testing. Uh, like Jägermeister, uh, this approach is painful. You feel like, and you are, doubling your test coverage. Uh, for instance, if any of you are familiar with Mongoid and you've looked at the test suite, there's something like 5,000 specs in that test suite. Um, it could be halved uh, if you did just one or the other, but uh, there's a reason for it in that you want to make sure that you can maintain good design and allow contributors to adhere to that design at the same time without, you know, supplying crazy underlying method code. We like to talk about uh, code quality versus time to market um, in kind of all aspects of so uh, software. Um, I think I'm being pretty blunt with this slide on what I think about code quality versus time to market and open source. Uh, Time to market uh, in open source should, should not matter whatsoever. Uh, it's not a competition. Uh, there's no business driving this behind it. Uh, you don't have to worry about losing competitive advantages. Um, there's no money involved here. Um, you shouldn't have to feel the pressure to push something to market faster uh, and sacrifice code quality for it as far as open source goes. Um, the Ruby community, when it comes to open source, is constantly looking for better frameworks, better ways to do things, always searching for gems. Uh, if you, you write a better gem a year later than someone else did a year before, it will be used. Uh, there's no reason to feel forced to push something out earlier. Uh, the gem that gets released first does not become the de facto, and if you can't contribute to it, that, that's not really a big deal. I mean, obviously, first you should try to contribute uh, before writing your own, but um, there, there's no reason to feel any pressure, and people are going to constantly pressure you into releasing something as quickly as possible, but it's definitely not necessary. Um, That's pretty much all about that. 
uh, workflow with accepting patches into open source. Uh, you should provide a single way to contribute to your project, and just one way, and that should become the standard of contributing to your project. Rails has a thing of doing patches on Lighthouse. I don't necessarily like it, but at least it's one particular way of doing things. Um, I would say if you're embracing GitHub, you go with pull request, uh, fork pull request, accept the pull request in. Uh, pull requests are nice on GitHub because they create their own issues. Um, so you've got a code and you've got an issue associated with it and you've got the project management aspect of it uh, in GitHub. Uh, you can have discussions around them, which is great. Uh, someone can submit a pu uh, pull request and you know, anyone who's looking at the project can have a conversation around that pull request. They can say what they like about it. They can say what they don't like about it. Uh, uh, you've got more context, and this also leads back into more documentation, uh, because on GitHub, your pull requests, your issues are there forever, um, and people can search for it. Uh, the other nice thing about doing a pull request system on GitHub is that uh, as a maintainer of a project, your commits are parsed by GitHub, and I don't have to go back to the web UI and say, oh, I closed this issue because of such and such. Um, my commit message is automatically put into the pull request and closes the issue, and we're done. Fine and dandy. From a user standpoint, uh, and this is uh, something I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about. When you're uh, including a gem in your application, it is part of your application. Uh, any bug, any performance issue in that gem is a bug and a performance issue in your application. Uh, it is an extension of your app. And because we are open source, the first thing I advise anyone to do on any open source project before you use it is go look at the source code. This is, uh, this is key. Uh, if you're going to look at the source code for, an app, uh, for a framework that you're going to use, and, well, it's shit code, ask yourself, do you want shit code in your application? Because essentially, by including that gem, you're putting shit code in your application. Uh, and I think a lot of people take, uh, oh, this gem is used for this all the time, and it's very popular, and we'll just use it and not think about it, that's wrong. You should, you should definitely look at the source code of your applications. That's what open source is for. Um, a prime example of this and is, you know, I, I'm a heavy Rails user, but when it comes to uh, relational databases on Rails frameworks, I use Data Mapper and I don't use Active Record. And that's because Data Mapper's code, source code, is far better factored than Active Records is. Um, and I trust it. Uh, I see too many shady things in Active Record that I just I don't trust it. Um, another thing to look for when you're going to use a gem is, besides looking at the source code, make sure it's got tests. Uh, why would you ever use a gem in your application that wasn't tested itself? when you yourself, all of us are testing people, right? We're all, we're all Ruby guys, we love testing. So just make sure that the gem has tests and uh, make sure the code is good. Another thing from a user's uh, perspective um, and a maintainer's pers uh, perspective, sometimes uh, you run into an issue with an open source project and you've gone through the code base and you don't know the best way to fix something. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, it's not quite apparent to you, you're, you're new to the project. Uh, the absolute best thing you can do, and this is like a ponies and rainbows situation for an open source author, is if you provide a pull request with a failing test. Uh, it's almost like I come in my pants when I see this. Uh, pull request, failing test, yes, I pull it in immediately. Uh, if you can't, navigate the framework or the test suite that well, 
to provide the failing test, uh, the next best thing you can do is, you know, gist. Give some sort of reproducible steps that the uh, maintainer of the project can, you know, start a new Rails project, new Sinatra project, and easily recreate it, and then they can write their own failing test for it. Uh, opening issues for projects uh, without anything uh, is just kind of unacceptable and it's a waste of people's time. Uh, sometimes people will say, oh, this just doesn't work. Okay. A uh, little bit of context would be, would be good here. Uh, those, uh, please provide at least something, but failing test first uh, will bring joy to all of your OSS maintainers' hearts. Twitter. Uh, Twitter has kind of gotten out of hand, in my opinion, and uh, by far is it not first-line tech support. Um, if you're a maintainer of a gem or an author of a gem, you should document uh, all the channels that people need to go through in order to maintain support for your gem. Uh, this can be mailing lists first, this can be GitHub issues, this could be Pivotal Tracker, you know, some other sort of tracking tool. But Twitter is definitely not it. And I think most of us follow hundreds of people and have hundreds or thousands, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands, I don't know. Nicholas has got like a million followers. Uh, the tweets are going to get lost. Uh, we can't keep up with them. So if you're going to tweet for tech support, uh, expect it not to be answered. Uh, it's uh, just not the way to do it. Further on the Twitter front, and this is actually my, uh, my biggest pet peeve with open source, <laughs> sorry. I know it creates an image that, you know, all eight arms of the cat. Okay. <laughs> it's got to fucking hurt. Uh, at least maybe once a day, twice a day, maybe once a week, uh, depending on the gem, depending on the framework, I see tweets coming out that go something like, blah, 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 I'm not going to use this technology because this my, insert my gem name here, sucks. Um, that, that's just absolute shit. Uh, it's unacceptable for people to do non-constructive criticism like that uh, in the open source community. And doing it over Twitter makes it even worse and it just pisses people off. It pisses me off. Um, and I want to say, like, people work really hard in their free time uh, to write open source software for you and to do something like this uh, just degrades the whole thing. The least you can show is a little bit of respect for people who are working on these things in your free time and provide constructive criticism. So instead of my, your library sucks tweet, I propose this. I disagree with your API because Dot, dot, dot. Or there is an issue with this, and here's a gist to show you an example to potentially fix it. On this case, um, as a maintainer, I would say if you get tweets of this nature, it's okay to call an asshole an asshole when they're being an asshole. By all means, if you want to call them out on Twitter and say get fisted by the Octocat, by all means do so. Um, I will applaud you for that. Um, the other thing, even though I'm kind of ruthless here and saying that is what I usually do, is kill them with kindness. And for most tweets that I've gotten over the past year or two on this front, I usually respond back saying, I'm so sorry that the framework did not do what you expected it to do. Um, could you provide me with a gist if you have the time and I will get to that issue as soon as possible and hopefully you will be able to use it again. And usually that works far better than telling them to get fisted um, 
because people feel bad at that point, and then they provide you with the gist, and then they become users at the end. Uh, but I'm not saying that you can't tell them to be fisted. And wow, I went through that fast. OK, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yes. Um, does anyone have any questions? I went 15 minutes too fast. That's if you pull pull it in you, a pull request with just a failing test. Yeah. Uh, that's if you pull it in through the GitHub UI. So well, the, I, I have to push it for you to pull it. So that means that I Oh, but that's that's fine for your fork to have a failing test on it. In my opinion, that's fine. You use a topic branch and you've got a failing test on your fork. No worries. Your, your, your suite may be failing, but mine's still passing. And mine's the one that matters, right? Okay. I can't really think of an example where time to market matters. I mean, the first one, the first one's going to be the early, the early adopter. Um, but over time, the better one is always, or whatever other options you have, they're going to eventually take over. Uh, and I, I, I see this with you know Ruby more than any other language that I've worked in in the community is that it seems like every day Rubyists are, I want to know what the next hot thing is. I want to know what new gem was released. I want to use it immediately. Is it better than what I'm already using? And I think that's like a daily thing for people. We're constantly looking at the blogs. We're constantly you know, looking at our GitHub streams. And if something better comes out a year later after we've been using something else, uh, it's going to be adopted. I don't necessarily uh, think, I mean, if you want early adoption, then time to market maybe matters, but eventually, if it's not a superior framework, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be faded out. Yeah, closing deal, so. Closing deal, uh, I mean, so there's a business aspect tied to it, yeah, then and, and that's a different story. I'm, what I'm referring to is like pure open source, no business tied to it whatsoever. Yeah, let's uh, get away from the slide. I was told live coding is like dangerous. Okay, so you've just seen that I've gone into the direct, uh, directory and I've got my... Uh... Oh, sorry. Can we see this? Uh, okay. Yeah, so there, it's, it's a basic RVMRC. We say, uh, whenever I enter the directory, if that gem set's not already created, just automatically create it. And then, in this case, I'm using Ruby 192, and the gem set name is Mongoid. Um, check that in. Uh, there, if someone doesn't have 192 installed, it will tell them, and it's, you know, RVM install 192. It's, uh, what I don't like is like having my global gem set polluted with like all sorts of crap. There should be like only two or three gems in my global gem set. Is there, you know, you is there a reason? Uh, so uh, if I want to start deleting, uh, deleting projects out of my, you know, my directory, I don't want. Uh, like an excessive amount of gems like sitting in my global gem set uh, for things to have to you know, be scanned through. 
we've got cache, we've got specifications, and then we've got all the gems sitting in three different directories. Uh, it's not very optimal the way that uh, gems work, but um, I like things to be fast. I've, I've gotten numerous amounts of emails over the past two years of people telling me to not check in my RVMRC. Uh, they're worried about, usually, I think they're not using RVM properly. <laughs> and for a while I was like, okay, I'm gonna be the nice guy and be like, I won't check in my RVMRC. And then I got tired of like going to new machines and then having to create a new RVMRC every time. So I just, I started checking it in and I say, fuck it. <coughs> yes. In my perfect world, um, we're all using Bundler and you're pointing uh, directly at the master branch and telling it what commit you want or pointing at a tag. Um, the one thing that I am guilty of is horrible versioning. Um, and I love to change public APIs in patch releases and, you know, so. I don't think you should be listening to me on this subject. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in the ideal world, you know, um, I don't know, there's, we're all using stuff that's not even 1.0 in production apps. So what does 1.0 mean anymore? What does, any ver I mean, what does any version number mean to us anymore? I think it's, um, most of the time in our production apps that we use at my current employer, we point at the repos themselves. Uh, and if we do a bundle update and something breaks from one of the repos, then we point in a specific commit on that repo. But we want the latest and greatest of everything all the time. Uh, it doesn't seem like the version numbers in, in Ruby open source in particular really mean that much. Um, maybe with the exception of Rails. They're, they're pretty strict on the way that they version things, but every other project is it seems like a free-for-all. I could be using something in production for two years that's at 0.5, but it works fine. Is, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Do you think people should be releasing production? That I'm not really sure about. I, uh, I think that given Given the way that we, we treat open source now, especially with respect to GitHub, I, I think versions are going to fade out. I think they're gonna be a thing of the past. And I think maybe tagging, tagging a branch or a specific point in time in your code base will become the new thing. And you, you may tag it with a name, something instead of a number, something that's uh, more usable uh, to people. Like, oh, what's, what's What's 1.36 do for me? That doesn't do much. But, oh, uh, we just added so-and-so feature here is much more meaningful to me as a developer. So, I'd, I mean, I'd, maybe I'd like to see pointing at specific tags instead of releasing versions at all. Oh, I, I missed that one. I don't, uh... So what is that? He said everyone is using test unit and... Too complex. Oh, wow. So we do, want, do we want to tweet this one here? So DHH is a douchebag for saying that. <laughs> Tweets. <laughs> Get your phones out. Um, I, 
I don't, I don't understand at this point in time why anyone, I mean, I understand why Rails, I think I understand why Rails is still using test unit because you've got a massive framework, test framework that's been there before RSpec existed. And the entire migration of test unit to RSpec on the Rails code base would be a, a fucking nightmare. But, I mean, let's lead by example. Okay, can I shrink this a little bit? Can we still read it? Is that readable? Yeah. Um, can you write something like this, as readable as this, in test unit, and have the output of it instead of bullshit dots running across your screen actually be readable output. In order to do this in test unit, I've got to write 100 character method names. Um, I don't, it's, it's just the organization of it is so much better. When you throw in filtering and focus from RSpec, um, it's such a more powerful framework. Uh, for example, and we're sitting on Mongoid right now, so, for things like this, um, I can do in my setup, uh, if you've got a certain number of databases set up on your local machine, and if they are set up or they're not set up, I'm going to give you warning messages on what you need to do to set them up or not, but I'm not going to fail your test suite because of it, I'm just going to filter them out. So I can do a filter run excluding, uh, excluding in RSpec, and then I can say, oh, well, if any of these things are not configured, uh, we're just going to skip them. And then when I go to my tests, um, Yeah, you can see here. I do a config slaves on that one that says, oh, well, if the slaves, are, slaves aren't configured, I'm just going to skip this and print that message out. Um, it comes back to the contributing factor and making people's lives painless. Um, someone who wants to contribute a feature to your open source project um, that may have nothing to do with slave databases, in my case here, uh, doesn't need to have slave databases running. Uh, so we just filter it out if they're not running. Uh, excuse me? That would be, but if I'm hoping in the context of it that if someone's contributing and they're, they know that they're going to affect a slave database right and this fact that they should be running them. I don't think it's that much magic. Um, I mean, for, for example, and I'll, I'll show you this and how it's, it, we make it apparent. Um, right, let's just run rake. So the first thing you're going to get here is because I don't have databases running slave data. Oh, let's, sorry. live coding. <laughs> oh.
There we go, okay. So you can see, the, because the slave databases are running, the first thing I do is print out a warning message telling you exactly what to do. And that kind of covers my filtering aspect there. Um, I mean, if you don't do something like that, then, then it can be kind of confusing if you broke anything. But um, I would say a good pattern is if you're filtering something out and someone, something doesn't adhere to that filter, then um, you need to be doing something like this. My internet connection. Okay, so we're hung trying to get an inter internet connection. Fun. Any other questions? Well, I'm of the opinion that CI, it's not just open source. Open source are generally, you know, their, your core contribution team is not that many people, usually five, six people, maybe 10 tops, depending on how big your project is. And I think on any development team, that small CI is actually unnecessary. Um, the only time I've actually found CI necessary was uh, when you have humongous development teams, which shouldn't be happening in any uh, the Ruby community. This is kind of like a Java.net thing, where you've got guys in India, you've got guys in the States, guys in Europe. Um, you know, usually, you know, you're all disciplined enough to know that you're not going to commit anything that breaks anything. Um, and I, I feel like CI is more of a pointer. Uh, yeah, finger pointing app than um, actually providing any real value. Um, this is this is also CI in its current incarnation, and in that it's not really continuous integration. It's continuous build, continuous run the specs. It's not integrating with anything. Um, true CI, I think, is worthwhile. Um, we've we've built something and we've deployed it somewhere in order for our users to continue to use it and be on the most recent versions of the software. But I think most people use CI as like a build tool. And in Ruby, it's not building anything. It's just running specs. Um, so I, I don't really see the point in it. We good? Thank you. All right. <laughs>